Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, this is one of our Alumni Career Weeks webinars uh, entitled Kickstart Your Career Change in Five Simple Steps. My name is Dan Gardner, and I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by Boston University Alumni Relations and is offered to our 326,000 alumni all around the globe. Now, throughout your career, BU strives uh, to help you de define and achieve your career and professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online events, online tools, and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so please be on the lookout for an Alumni Career Week survey that will be emailed to you next week. I know we have alumni joining us today from places like Oakland, California, Cartersville, Georgia, Ridgewood, New Jersey, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, mm. Silver Spring, Maryland, Bangkok, Thailand, Paris, France, Milano, Italy, along with dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Austin, Concord, Mattapan, Watertown, and many more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, just a couple of housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on our brand new Zoom meeting platform. If you experience any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, please contact Zoom support directly at 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing at the Alumni Association website, and you can find that at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions that you all have, uh, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box. And you can find this by hovering over your screen uh, and find the Q&A box at either the top or bottom of that toolbar. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for, to, for the day, College of Arts and Sciences alumna, Carly Goldsmith. Carly supports mid-career professionals in achieving greater career success, finding meaningful work, and living fulfilling lives. She brings over 20 years of human resource and business experience to work for her clients. Compassionate and intuitive by nature, Carly draws from personal and professional experience as well as her extensive training and certification in coaching individuals, relationships, and teams. She holds PCC certification from the International Coach Federation, a bachelor's degree from Boston University, and a certified in various assessment tools. So Carly, thank you so much for being here today, and I'm happy to report the floor is all yours. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. And welcome, everyone, to today's session. I'm excited to be here. Uh, for those of you around the world and not here in New England, uh, I am looking out the window at some snow flurries falling, uh, and I'm glad that the virtual nature of this doesn't prevent us from being here today. Uh, so I've got tons to cover, and I'm just so thrilled to continue to come back uh, to be you and to the community year after year, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. So as a career coach, one of the things I hear over and over and over again is, I know I'm unhappy and I want to make a change and how do I do that? So part of today is going to give you some of those foundational steps in order to make your change no matter what you want to do. But before I dive into that content, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So Dan's going to put a poll up right now. Here you go. So tell me a bit about your professional work life. How many years have you been in the workforce? Are you a newbie? Zero to five years. Maybe you're in that six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, and so on. Maybe you've been around for a long time and you're in that 40 year plus uh, space. So we've got a broad range of where you could be in your career. And just go ahead and share that. And it looks like we've got some results here. So doing a quick scan, most of you, although there's pretty equal distribution, are either brand new with zero to five years in that 11 to 15 year range, 
or in that 26 to 30 range. Uh, so we do have a, a broad cross section today and we'll cover a number of things that you could do in, in all of those spaces. Uh, but one of the things to, to think about your career, we'll get to this in a bit, is that you really have three distinct phases with your career. I like to say anything in that first 10 to 15 years, you could think about as uh, investment, you're putting money into the bank, knowledge, skills, experience, some of those foundational things. And in that second 10, 15 years or so, what you're doing there is uh, paying yourself back. You're uh, being intentional about how you make a bigger impact, how you find work that's more fulfilling and meaningful for you. And in that last stage of your career, the end of your career, it's that giving back, it's the legacy, it's how do you want to contribute to those newer generations coming up. So a way to kind of group these years into different places for you. Let me ask the second question that I have here. So once again, Dan will put that polling question up. There we've got it. But, but what really represents your current state? Are you unhappy, but just don't know what's gonna make you happier? Perhaps you have a good idea, but you just don't know how to get there. Uh, perhaps you're in this place where, hey, you know what? I'm in a pretty good place. I like my career. I just need some tweaks. How do I improve it? Uh, and, and the last one, maybe there are some of you who are just thrilled to death with where you are in your career and it's meeting what you need. Uh, so let's see, group, where are you? What's your distribution here? My guess. And yeah, <laughs> we call this how do you kickstart your career change. So my guess was that we were probably not going to have many or any of you in that I love my career. Uh, so most of you are in that place where you either are unhappy and don't know what to do or that you've got a good sense. You just don't know how to get started. You don't know how to break through that momentum and make that change. Uh, so that is perfect for us today because we are going to give you some of those things and what we need to do to, to move you forward. And at any point in your career, you're going to find yourself at all of these phases uh, you're going to have moments where you find that it's fantastic and sometimes when you are less than satisfied. And you'll find that it's triggered sometimes by external forces, things in the workplace change, your organization, the economy, your life, right? The phase of life that you're in might change as well. And then sometimes it's it's just an internal thing. It's, it's for you. You now are getting clearer and more confident about what you want and what's meaningful and fulfilling for you, uh, how that changes. So the five steps I'm going to give you are, are really geared to those of you who want to make a change um, and don't know where to start. And I'll say, even for those of you who fell in this first bucket, that you can't quite articulate what it is that you want to do next, you're still able to use these steps to start to put some of those things in place uh, to move forward. So it really is about those fundamentals and how do you uh, get, get to the next step. So I'm going to put this quote up here uh, because I really like it, right? You are all here, my guess, because you had some sort of yearning or desire, a little bit of a spark that says, I am ready to get out of the current situation that I'm in and to stop ignoring it. Because if we don't nourish that spark that we, that we find, it's difficult for us to make that change. They fade, they go away. Um, so my question to you is, how are you nourishing that spark? And if you're not, Pay attention, because we're going to give you some ways that you can nourish that for yourself. So the first step that I want to raise your awareness about is asking the hard questions. Really, truly get clear on what your motivations are. Why now? Why a change? What happened? What's the trigger behind that? Uh, do you really, is it an external force that is changing? It is an internal desire to make a change. Really get clear on what's that driver and the motivation for you to change. Another great way to kind of ask those hard questions is to envision what success looks like. And not by 
your parents' idea of success or your colleagues, your significant others, society, but what is your definition of success? Oftentimes we find that we've been making choices, whether we know it or not, to meet someone else's definition of success for our careers. And how can we shift and take a look at what is our own definition of success and envision that. And my challenge to you is also to envision the biggest picture. Uh, my, my clients that come, uh, usually they are unhappy with work, but they're unhappy with how everything is impacted by their work, their life, uh, that whole fit and that balance. So look at that big picture. Sometimes you can get some clues, even if you're not sure about what it is that you want to do. Uh, the other step is be realistic about what's possible. Uh, sometimes I've got clients who uh, want to make a complete change, go in a fully new direction, and they want to do it in two months. Um, so what's realistic? What's possible? Can you think about the phases, the steps, those slower incremental things that you could do? Um, and what is that first step? What are those first changes that you can make? And then the last one and this is one that oftentimes we are unaware of, and I work with my clients on a lot in the very beginning, and that's what are some of those thought processes that need to be dropped in order to allow you to make some changes, uh, to, to break forward? Are there assumptions you're making about what's possible? Um, I had a client of mine who, just yesterday, we were talking, and he's got this desire to start his own business, but he's got this seed that's planted you know, from his family from growing up that you're supposed to have a paycheck and a steady job. Um, and he's recognizing that that assumption, that belief that having a paycheck and being an employee is the only way to have a real job. Um, and he's realizing that in order to pursue what he truly wants, he's got to let go of that thought process. Um, that that self-employment, that business ownership is legitimate. It's, it's true and it's something that he needs to in embrace in order to move forward. So starting with those hard questions, the underlying drives, those motivations, what really is success for you, not for anybody else? What's possible? What's that realistic way to get there? Um, are some of those key first things that you need to do? Again, regardless of if you know what you want or if you don't. So what's our second step? Uh, this one, is a powerful one and that's to assess the resources that you have available to you. Uh, we often find ourselves in this place of feeling like we've got scarcity or lack or not enough um, and that feels discouraging to us when we're looking to make that career change. So, so take a look, right? Time, what kind of time do you have? Can you look at your schedule? Can you carve out time to invest in research and reflection and thinking and conversations? Um, can you say no to some things, clear some space? I'll talk about that in a minute, but can you really open up that time in order to contribute that? And money. I hear this oftentimes. Well, I can't afford to change careers. I've got this great salary and benefits, or you know, I don't have enough for here. And I often say that our fears come up and we just use money sometimes as an excuse without taking a look at what do we really have. Um, so take a look at your resources around money. What do you have? Um, can you tap into savings? Do you have to invest in training in things to, to move you forward that will pay off in the end? Um, can you also think about time and money together? Maybe you're willing to invest some time and money uh, for a defined period uh, in order to, to move things forward. So take a look at those two. Uh, if you are looking for a way to do this, um, I'll send out a link to a companion guide that goes to this course, and you'll see that I've got worksheets all around all of these exercises and more and all these tips. And one of them is kind of your balance sheet. What's, what's a way to think about everything that you've got from a resource perspective around money? 
and then your skills, your strengths, your, your expertise, even if you are looking to make a change and, and do something slightly different, it doesn't mean that you haven't learned some of those foundational skills that are going to bring you forward, um, that will allow you to make the change and to do a different career. Uh, who's in your network? Who can you activate, warm up, start talking to? Uh, I'll tell you, I often hear, well, I don't know anyone who's gonna help me with my change um, or help me research or connect me to the right places. Uh, so I'll give you a challenge that I give most of my clients, and that is take a blank piece of paper out, set your timer for three minutes on your phone and write as many people as you could think about. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, your kids' friends and parents and who you know from school. Think about as many people as possible. My guess is that you'll hit 30 to 50 people in that three minutes uh, that will come to mind. Um, and even if they're not perfect, they might know someone um, to go from there. Go to your LinkedIn, take a look. Who do you know? Who can you start to have some conversations with? Chances are you know more people than you think you do uh, in order to start bridging the gap and, and informing yourself and, and making those next steps. Um, and then this last one I, I really like here uh, from a resource perspective, and that's how are you know? What's your reputation? What's your brand right now? And even if you have a strong brand in your current career and you're looking to make a change, that's still valuable. It still uh, allows you to have that expertise, that, um, that trust, that faith that others were willing to help you. Because if you could be successful in one area, um, it's likely that you'll be successful in another area as well. So take a look. What do you have and what can you use or leverage in order to make the change happen? Um, this is a big gap that we sometimes fail to take a look at. So, so make those, those intentional looks at your resources. All right, step three is face your fears. What we know is that any change, even if it's trying to move you away from a situation that feels unbearable, raises up certain fears that we have. And we often know that the fears are there, but we don't articulate. We don't want to dwell in them. Uh, and I invite you to sit with those fears for a minute. And you see that my first question here is to flesh out as much as possible, what is the worst thing that can happen? The worst case scenario, what does it look like? Who does it impact? What, what is that? And really step into that. And then imagine that that actually happened. And now, give yourself the opportunity to build a plan. What would you do? If that actually happened, how would you get out of it? What would you leverage? What would you do? Who would you ask for help? How can you recover if that worst case scenario happens? And oftentimes if we do that, what we have done is we've given ourselves an antidote to the excuses that come up that I can't do this, that I shouldn't do this. Because you've already shown yourself that you are able to recover from it and find a way and figure it out, even if it means going back to your old job or your old career that you're currently in. And this last question here is also a powerful one. For those of you who are still resistant, you're still trying to say, no, I, I can't do this, I have too many fears. And that is to envision what would happen five, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, if you're still on your current path and you don't make a change. And what we find is that typically that pain, that fear of that becoming reality outweighs the fear of making any change. Um, and I, I'm gonna give you this one thing a, someone said this to me and I really liked it. You know, we hear the word fearless a lot, right? And, and it's used in this way and the textbook definition, right, is the lack of fear. But this person said to me, you know, I don't think fearless means having no fear. 
because all of us have fears. What I actually think is that fearless means that you recognize your fear, you face it, you decide to take that step and move forward. You act in a fearless way despite the fear of still being there because you figured out a way to manage it and contain it. And that boldness, that courage to, to push past and to take that action is really what fearlessness is all about. Um, so how can you be more fearless by facing some of those fears that you've got? All right, so I said this earlier, and I think that this is another place that we underestimate what we can do to start things going. And that is making space for the change and building up some of those reserves, right? So some of you might run races or marathons, right? I, stop. I, I have not done that, but I've done other things where I need to train and practice and prepare, right? You wouldn't run the Boston Marathon in a very short few weeks away without taking time to train and to practice and to get yourself ready to make that change, right? So if you're thinking about a career change, you don't just get at the starting line and think that you're just gonna make that change without doing some of that preparation. So you'll see I've got a little equation here, which is yes equals no. And I just actually got off the phone with a client about a half hour ago, and this is what we spend our time doing. What she finds is that she says yes to a lot of things, um, whether it's consciously or not. And what that means is by default, we say no to a lot of other things. And many of you might find yourself in that same place. We overcommit for a variety of different reasons. Maybe it's even things that we love to do, and that's why we're saying yes. But oftentimes, we're just blind to saying yes, and we've got this whole list of things that we could do. So one easy way that you could do this is write a list, yes, here are all the things on my plate right now that I say yes to in and outside of work in my whole life. And then what are some of those things that you are saying no to right now that you'd like to say yes to? And it might be, I wanna say yes to doing research, to figuring out what this change is gonna to be, to networking, taking some classes, getting a certification, whatever those things are in order to move yourself forward in your career. And so what you have to do after you've got these two columns is to prioritize them. What are those top things in your no column that you want to shift to your yes column? And because our time and our resources and our energy are finite, how do we then say no to some of those things in our yes column? So as my client earlier today, one of the things we did was uh, we went through all of these extracurriculars that she loved, but we prioritized them. And we're figuring out some ways for her to say no to some of those things. So that way she could open up some space to make the career change she's looking to make um, because it does take that investment. And then this last piece here is really about how do you nourish yourself? How do you take care of yourself? Uh, you know, to go back to the marathon training, right? We, we need to take care of ourselves and make sure that we're at top capacity in order to make those changes. So are you exercising, uh, even if it's small, even if it's now that the weather is hopefully turning for the best, getting out there, um, walking, meditating, taking that time to center yourself, sleeping better, and having human connection. We often find that, that in these times of unhappiness and change, human nature is to self-isolate uh, for a variety of different reasons. We've got fear of judgment, uh, fear of uh, that shame, perhaps. How did I get here? Why am I so unhappy? What's wrong with me? Um, and we find that it's, it's in these moments when you make that human connection, start sharing uh, what it is that's going on for you and, 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 and connecting with others that it helps to nourish you and to build those, those reserves um, in order to make that, that change going forward. 
And then it brings us to our last step. And I hear this over and over and over again. Um, and I, I will tell you, again, my client yesterday, uh, I do these uh, in-depth retreats with clients. So uh, my client and I spent a whole day together and he's got these fantastic ideas. And I asked, okay, so who's helping you with this? Um, who have you talked to? And he said, oh, no one. And he's had these ideas for about 10 years now. Um, and he hasn't reached out. He said, you know, you're one of the first people I've actually admitted to uh, that I want to make some change and I want to get some help. Uh, so reach out. I, I love this idea of how do you build your own personal board of directors? So you don't have to shout it from the rooftops, send emails out to everyone, but can you build a small group of trusted individuals around you to support you through this change. And know that you can't have one or two people serve all roles that you need. You might need one person who's just your cheerleader. Maybe there's one person who's just gonna ask you those really hard questions and challenge you and push your thinking to the edge. Um, maybe it's a mentor. Maybe it's someone who has actually done the change that you want to make or has is now in the career that you are looking to to go towards but have that board have that group of individuals that are there to support you and here's another one too and that's being purposeful of who you are spending your time with uh, for many of us we have naysayers right who are chirping in our ears you can't go ahead and quit your job. Why would you do that? You're so successful. You're making money. Uh, you know, you've got a family to provide for. Um, and, and it might be that, that those individuals are reflecting on their own values, their own success, their own perception of why you should or should not do what you do. Um, and, and I invite you to limit the contact that you've got with some of those folks during this time and surround yourself with people who see the possibilities and who believe in you and have faith in you during that change. I know um, a bit of my background, I left my corporate life uh, back in, in early 2009. Uh, and for those of you who are in the workforce around that time, you know that at the end of 08 and the beginning of 09, we had a really big downturn and many folks were out of work and unemployed. I saw many team members around me in my organization being let go in, in that same place. And I felt lucky in some ways, um, but very unlucky in others because I was not doing the work that I wanted to do. And when this idea started to really, that spark that we talked about at the beginning, uh, started to grow and say, I, I think it's time for me to go, voluntarily, intentionally. Um, I had many people who said, you're crazy, Carly, why would you do this? Why would you leave stability when there's so much instability in the marketplace? Um, and I knew I couldn't listen to those voices and, and intentionally surrounded myself with others who supported the idea. And I'm happy to say nine years later, I, I don't look back um, and I'm very glad um, that I was able to do that. And, and there were challenges and there were tough times and there was a big leap of faith and, and struggles in that time um, that all of us make during times of change. Um, and it's about what's that payoff at the end and, and how do you intentionally surround yourself. So get help, even though at this time, during this unhappiness, perhaps you're feeling like you want to just close up um, and not share how you're feeling with others. So those are the five steps um, which are foundational to any change that you're looking to make, whether it is a full career change or a job change. And you might be actually wondering, do I need a career change? Do I just need a job change? Do I need to do some things differently in my work? Um, and I'll, I'll call attention again to uh, my website, my blog. One of the things that you'll find on there is some quizzes um, that help you go through and process 
Is it a career change or a job change? Is it, do I need to think about how I develop or be intentional in my current career uh, to be more successful, do something different or make a change? Uh, so you can go out there and, and take a look um, and, and see for you really where are you and, and what change do you need to make? Um, but with all of that, I want to stop now that we've hit our half hour mark um, and ask questions of you because what I find is I can share these tips, but it's your questions, your stories that really bring all of this to life and, and help us explore. So I know Dan's going to help me now. Um, I invite you to put your questions into Q&A uh, so that way we can see them and we can answer them. All right, Dan, so are we seeing any questions yet? Yeah, we do have a couple questions. And again, I'd encourage uh, all our participants to go ahead and hover over the screen um, and you'll see a Q&A box uh, and you can submit additional questions there for Carly. Um, so we do have a couple questions uh, to get the conversation going. Um, so you said that you recommend that we start this conversation um, with some of our LinkedIn contacts, but uh, I don't know about you, but I'm connected to some folks on LinkedIn, and I've been connected them uh, to them for a very long time. Uh, how do you break the ice with a contact that you haven't necessarily kept up with, um, but who would now be really valuable as you're thinking about a career change? Yeah, I love that question, and I get it all the time. Here's my one recommendation, right? We are humans and it's about relationships, right? And if we have not talked to someone for years and the first contact we have with them is like, hey, can you put me in touch with someone at your company? Because I really want to interview there. It's probably going to go over like a lead balloon, right? Um, so I often say, take the approach of building the relationship and the connection again. Uh, so, uh, so some of the things I usually do is I think about the season or the time of the year. Oh, hey, you know, it's the spring. I'm thinking about change and growth. Uh, you know, I saw your name pop up and, and do that. Maybe, maybe it's the holidays and you think about that or it's summer vacation and I'm taking some time and I'm thinking about all these connections I have. Figure out a way to make that uh, connection first. And once you warm it up and you start um, an interchange, then you can talk about, hey, listen, you know, I'm actually been at this point where I'm at a crossroads and I'm thinking about what's next. I'm hoping you can be valuable for me. Um, I, I, you also made me think about a client of mine who she went back to old colleagues of her that she had not worked with for about 10 years. And she had a ton of fears that they would be like, who are you? I don't remember you. Um, and she was so pleasantly surprised that she had all of these conversations with folks all over the place. And from there was able to either dig into deep about their ideas or get other thoughts and other people that they connect her with. So start with the human connection and then go to the ask from there. All right, that sounds great. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, one person's asking, do you recommend going back to school or taking classes before heading out to look for a new job? Uh, how do you help your clients uh, weigh that decision? Mm -hmm. um, so I always say before you invest in education, certification, additional training, is to check the assumption that that's required to actually make the change that you're looking for. I will tell you, as big as investing in school or a certification or a training program is, many people choose that as actually the safe route to go because they still don't have to face the change. Um, so get out there, do some research, understand, is it necessary, is it required, is it gonna be the right return on the investment or not? Um, because it may not be, and it may actually just be your way of hiding from the change a little bit longer. All right, that sounds, that sounds great. I've got another kind of a similar question, uh, but maybe the phrasing will um, inspire you to give a slightly different take, but how do you recommend folks get over the catch-22 of needing that experience to start your new career? Um, but needing a job in that new field in order to gain the experience. 
Yeah, and it happens all the time, right? What comes first, um, the experience or the job or the job or the experience? Uh, so sometimes what we could do, and, and I, I, I will challenge folks to do this, can you do something in a volunteer organization or on the side, uh, something where you're getting experience, maybe, it's in your current organization and it's a extracurricular project that you could work on. Some way where you can dabble, you can not change the job first, but you can gain a little bit of that experience. Um, and your any of that kind of extracurricular volunteerism, um, side hustles, any of those things can become legitimate experience that we then put on a resume or talk through while we're trying to make that change. And it helps us get the leg up when you're ready to make that job change. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. So we've got another question here. Can you tell me uh, where to start um, when you know that you want a change, um, but you're not sure what your new career should be. So how do you figure out what you might be good at um, and what's out there? Yeah. All right. So there's two or three things that I will tell most folks to to think about when they are in this place where they say, I don't know. Um, and that is one, take some time to, instead of thinking about full job titles or careers or organizations, take a couple of weeks to think about, maybe you're even like an investigator in your day. What are the moments, the activities, the things that make you feel strong and effective and capable and time flies while you're doing them? And on the flip side, what are some of those things that drain you? And what you actually end up with are things that you are good at and that you like to do, things that you are good at and don't like to do because they drain you, right? And things that you are, let's say, not good at but love doing. You're not good at them yet, but you love to do them. And then those things that you don't love and you're not good at. And that can be a way to help you see some patterns of, of what you want to do. The other thing that I challenge you to do is pay attention to what you are drawn to. What do you read about? What do you watch about on TV? What do you want to learn about, know about, talk about? That's another way for us to get insights into where are we naturally gravitating towards. Um, and the third thing is, when I hear, I don't know what I want to do, I actually think that's code for, I know it, I'm just too afraid to do it or to tell anyone. Um, so I usually tell people, if you could just write it down, tell one other person the craziest idea that you have about what you'd actually want to do, if you could wave that magic wand, you're going to get some clues as to what is truly there for you. All right. Uh, so we have a logistical question here about... Uh managing the continual access that folks need to good health care and insurance mm. while training for a new career or starting out as um, someone who's self-employed. Do you have any tips there? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways to go and it's a bit challenging uh, based on how healthcare is is unknown at the moment. Um, so some of the things that, that I think about is, right, we always typically, if you've got access to um, insurance now, if you leave, most states have the rule, you know, it might be different around the country, but, um, you know, you get the opportunity to access COBRA, which is continuing coverage afterwards. It typically goes 18 months past, um, so at least um, it can bridge the gap. Um, again, going back to the money picture, you have to understand what is that cost going to be because it's typically 100% plus an administration fee of the cost of the insurance, even for COBRA. So what are those numbers? Um, what are the numbers? If you went to um, the Affordable Care Act and what are the access for your state, what kind of options do you have, even if it's some basics? Um, if you're lucky enough to have a significant other who maybe you have been on your insurance, but could you change insurance? Um, 
I'll tell you, that's one of the things I did. When I became self-employed, my husband was self-employed at the time, and we kind of bargained, you know? Now it's his time to get the job that's going to do that. Um, so there might be other options that way. Um, so there's, there's different ways to, to get access. Um, it is an investment, and plan for that. Um, in order to make that change. And I'll tell you, you know, even folks who are self-employed, there are options of ways that you can become an employer and purchase employer insurance, even if you're self-employed. So there's other options uh, that you can get into as well. All right, great. I appreciate the personal experience there on that one. I think that's really helpful for, for people to hear that uh, you're not only someone who preaches this stuff, but you've actually uh, done it and made that, made that jump. So uh, I think that was really helpful. Uh, speaking of gaps, um, how do you uh, explain periods of time, maybe without employment, uh, during this career change, this transition time? Um, you know, once you are putting yourself back out there, uh, how do you recommend folks approach that, maybe in a cover letter or in an interview setting? Mm, great, great question. And there's so many reasons why we look to make changes or why we have gaps. Maybe they were forced upon us. Maybe we intentionally took them. Um, there's a couple of things. I think we have come to a place in society, in our culture, where gaps are more acceptable um, than they had been, right? Because pe people are making changes a lot more often uh, than, you know, our parents' generations where they stayed at the same employer for their entire careers. Um, so think about ways, what did you learn during that time? Um, how did you spend your time? What did you learn about yourself? Did you make a different investment? Um, if you can speak to the insights or the changes or the investments that you made during that time, that will also help explain it um, and help bridge that. Again, going to my own experience, I took an eight week, I'm not doing anything, uh, kind of leave from work um, just to invest in myself and my health and to do a lot of these things that we have talked about today because I knew I wasn't in that mental place, physical place to make that change. Um, and I took that eight week leave to, to really recover for that. Um, and that became part of my story when I was looking to do the next thing, that it was about investing in myself. You see a lot more organizations have sabbatical programs or leave programs. So maybe you could take advantage of that yourself um, and, and explain that. But what did you take from that experience and how do you weave it into part of your story and your learning and your growth um, can oftentimes explain the gaps. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Jacob. Uh, how do I have my resume reviewed or updated? Um, how would you recommend someone go about doing that if they're not quite comfortable um, doing it themselves? Yeah, so I will tell you there are a host of certified professional resume writers that are out there. Um, and you can find them. There's a number of different designations. I, I could probably refer my guy that I work with all the time. Uh, he's in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, so there, there are a number of different individuals who do that. Um, that's part of their role. Uh, they will take a look at your resume, they'll rewrite it for you if you want. So there's a number of different resources. And my guess, Dan, I'm gonna kick this question back to you, um, is what do we have for BU alumni? Is there opportunity for career services, um, others in, in the environment to take a look at, at resumes and get feedback? Absolutely, the, the Center for Career Development doesn't only support students, uh, but they are certainly there to support you as alumni. Uh, throughout your career. Uh, we also have a number of uh, really great folks who uh, continuously post um, new engaging content about resumes and job searches uh, within our LinkedIn alumni group. Nice. So Boston University alumni on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find some really great professionals who are fellow terriers uh, if you're looking for folks to reach out to. Um, but the Center for Career Development, uh, their website, there are plenty of resources, different templates that you can uh, take a look at, uh, you know, weighing the pros and cons of starting out with an objective statement and those types of things. No matter what industry you're in, uh, I think they have resources for just about everybody uh, if you want to take a look at their website. So 
thank you for letting me get that plug in. <laughs> I knew it was out there and I see it all the time. Um, and I'm going to give one little bit of really targeted advice for those of you who are looking to make a career change. And that's investing in that top third of your resume in a professional summary. Uh, with some key accomplishments. And this is a way for you to connect the dots and thread together a story from perhaps multiple places of your career that's telling the story about where it is that you wanna go next. So that way, someone who's getting your resume doesn't just see everything you used to do, but they see a really concise story about why you want to make that change. You're taking the guesswork out of it so someone doesn't just toss the resume in the pile. Um, so how do you think about a resume as positioning you for your future work versus just a recap of your past work? So it's a mindset shift for many of us, um, but it's a, it's a way to make the resume powerful for where you want to go. Great, and that leads us right into another question that we have here. Do you have suggestions for how to stand out from the crowd in that application pile, uh, especially as someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of relevant work experience um, as they're trying to get this change up and running? Uh, how do you recommend, uh, you know, I think your resume tips are certainly useful. Are there any other tips that you have, whether it be in a cover letter or um, in another format when you're trying to stand out from that crowd of hundreds, if not thousands, of other applicants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is where I, I come back to this stat, which is, is a little bit uh, tough for many people to swallow. But if you're trying to make a change for a job, especially if you're looking to make a career change, if you're spending the majority of your time just sending out applications and applying, though it takes hours sometimes to apply for those positions online, you're investing in a way that's only gonna pay off about 5% of the time, if that's all you're doing. And so I invite you to invest your time, even if it feels out of your comfort zone, into seeing who you're connected to, how can you have someone open a door, give you some insight, give you a name uh, to make those connections. You'll still have to apply, um, but it gets you to the top of the pile. Um, it gets you to a place where someone is able to uh, advocate for you, or even if they don't know you well, just say, hey, you know, Dan's great, I worked with him here, you know, just take a look um, at his resume. So leveraging your network, um, investing in that, Sometimes even selling why you've got a personal connection. So using a cover letter, why do you have a personal connection with this role or this work that you want to do or the organization uh, can help as well. All right, that sounds great. I have a, a question here and I think um, I loved what, what you said about creating that personal board of directors. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question about how to deal with um, lack of previous supervisors uh, mm -hmm. who might serve as a reference. Uh, so people who you might wish could be, you know, part of your team to advocate for you as you begin this career change. Um, but how do you deal with supervisors in the past who wouldn't be uh, reliably strong or positive references on your behalf? Don't use them. <laughs> um, so, so here's the thing. You don't necessarily need a direct supervisor all the time for references. Uh, I, I tell folks all the time, think about... Uh, colleagues, peers, think about maybe more senior leaders who you had perhaps a better relationship with. Maybe it was a, uh, another internal group or customer that you had that you did work for, whatever your work was impacted somebody else. Uh, maybe it was a direct report, right? So there's a number of different ways. If you think about it in a 360 way, right? We talk about 360 feedback. That's also a way to think about your references as well. And I'm going to tell you, most often when companies are doing background checks and they're doing references, they're contacting a 1-800 number at your old employer and they're saying, you know, was this person hold this job for this amount of time and make this money. They're, they're really looking at the facts more than talking to someone. Um, so you've got some space to think more creatively about who they actually talk to for that personal reference in addition to, you know, they're going to get your name, rank, and serial number just from, you know, the 1-800 number. All right. 
Uh, I've got a, an anonymous question here. Uh, now, you mentioned your personal reputation and your brand. Mm -hmm. What happens if, in the folly of your youth, you burn some bridges? Uh, how do you repair that professional reputation? Mm. Uh, so I think that owning it and taking the investment to repair it is the first step. Um, and also processing your own uh, emotional connection to it, right? Oftentimes what happens is that when we recognize that we've made some missteps, uh, we, uh, we, we just let that fear shut us down and we stay in this emotional turmoil. Um, I, I'm going to give you a client that I work with uh, many years ago. Uh, she got uh, fired from her company by making a very bad misstep. Um, I, I won't say exactly what it was, uh, but I will tell you her face landed on the front page of the news. Um, so it was very difficult. Um, and one of the things that we processed and we worked together was how did she own what she contributed to that? How did she learn from that? How was she wiser and different now based on that? Um, what, uh, what, what will she know that she's going to commit to that she'll never do from there? And she had to rebuild a little bit. She had to kind of start a, a little bit more junior and getting a foot back in the door in a career and building some credibility and a new, you know, reputation from there uh, before she made that change. So it was probably a, at the end of the day, five year process from, you know, her face on the front page of the news um, all the way until she was back to a, a professional role that was at the same status that she had been at before. And it did take that time and internally processing it and owning it uh, was one of the first things so she could neutrally talk about it um, and, and be okay with it. All right, thank you. That sounds, that sounds good. It's a, a challenging road, but certainly not an insurmountable challenge. Not at all. Uh, now we've got a couple questions. Um, you know, one question here, am I at risk of changing uh, careers after 40? We've got another question. Um, when considering whether to leave your current job before having found a new job, one of the biggest concerns of being out of work, uh, in addition to ageism, um, is that gap on your on your resume. So how do you get over the fear um, and explaining to potential employers the need or desire uh, for a change at that later stage in the game? Mm -hmm. um, so what's really interesting is you know, I work with mid-career professionals, so many of my individuals are kind of at or about 40 to 50. Um, they're, you know, I would say between 35 and 50 are most of my clients. And so we see changes being made all the time. And I think it's about how you see the change and how you speak to the change. We're at a powerful time in midlife where you've learned a lot of lessons. You've collected, like I said at the very beginning, uh, you've collected a lot of money in the bank, a lot of experience in the bank. Um, and so sometimes positioning it as, you know, I now want to make the biggest and best contribution, and here's how I want to do that. Um, here's how I see I can make that difference. So it's a lot about the wisdom and how you are sharing that um, and how you can leverage your experience. And I'd say neutralize anything that might let you fall victim to the ageism. You know, sometimes take some of the older experience off your resume and LinkedIn, remove the dates of when you graduate. There's subtle things that you could do. Uh, keep on top of technology changes or the most current things that are happening in your industry or the industry that you want to go in. So it becomes a non-issue um, and it doesn't um, kind of date you or make you feel or appear to be out of touch. Um, I'm also a big fan of leverage the younger folks that you're around to be in touch with, what are people talking about these days? What are they like, right? Um, what's happening? You know, I, I know for me, I was having this conversation with someone, strong millennial, you know, in their 20s, and they seem like a, sorry, Dan, right? <laughs> they seem like a foreign creature, um, but it's about keeping up with that. So that way it doesn't become an issue. And, and I think I spoke to the gaps a little bit before 
Um, you know, so it's, it's again, how do you leverage that? How do you position that um, to make it a value to what you're trying to do next? All right. Uh, thank you. And no offense taken on the millennial comment. <laughs> uh, don't worry about all. Um, we've got another question here about uh, articulating your the skills that can be applied um, to a new job in a new field or industry. Um, but uh, our um, participant says that it feels like I need to be an expert in a specific top in a specific topic just to get an interview. Mm. Uh, so how do you get your foot in the door when you're trying to get into something new when you have transferable skills, but it's not as obvious? Right. Okay. So speaking to the transferable skills and bringing those out um, in your conversations, in your resume, right? So um, I don't know, for those of you who think about the way you dress, right? We all have parts of our body that we like and that we don't like, and we're going to accentuate the good and hide or minimize the bad, right? It's the same thing with how you're talking about your experience. Um, you want to highlight those transferable things. And it might mean, if it's a particular subject matter expertise, this might be where you need to take a course, read certain books, maybe get a quick credential or you know something around it that says, I can do this. And there's a lot of cost-effective ways to do that, whether they're online courses, um, things that you could have access to, that just say, I'm keeping on top of this and I'm gathering data in this new area. Um, if you don't have all of the experience to back it up. So the transferable skills combined with what are you doing to understand that subject matter um, helps get over that hurdle sometimes. All right, and I'm sorry to say we will probably run out of time before <laughs> we can get to every question that was asked. So for anyone who asked a question that we haven't touched on yet, um, I certainly encourage you to visit um, Carly's website uh, where there are a lot of resources that you might find uh, useful and you might be able to find answers to some of those questions um, that we won't get to. But for one final question today, um, how do we deal with overqualification when we still really like the job that, uh, to which we're applying? Uh, so, that, so how do you deal with overqualification for what? So how do you deal with overqualification if, you, uh, if your resume will read as if you're overqualified? Um, but it's a job that you're still really interested in and a job that you would uh, love to tackle if given the opportunity. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, highlighting some of the things that are the transferable skills to what you want to do and maybe diminishing some others. I'll tell you, I had a, a client um, earlier this year, uh, who, or last year actually, who she was a director, she had leaded a department, led a department, and she wanted to kind of go back to being an individual contributor. Uh, she knew it was more of her sweet spot and what she wanted to do, and she did. She had to minimize some of the things that she talked about, and she also communicated, I know this is my strength, this is where I am right now, this is the kind of role that I want to do, and was able to speak to how that was the value that was the difference in the things that she wanted to do um, and that was able to sell the story a little bit and it took some time she got pushed back um, not to say that she didn't uh, but finally found the right place and the right role and the right people um, who can see that um, and and accept that all right well thank you very much we're just coming up uh, at the top of the hour so uh, I just want to say thank you Carly once again for being a spectacular uh, presenter for the uh, Alumni Career Week series that we've got going on this, this month. Um, we so appreciate your advice, your expertise, uh, and your willingness to pay it forward and help out uh, your fellow carriers. So thank you again for being here. Well, great, and thank you. And I've got one last quote on the screen, right? I, wanna, I want you all to think, you can't go back and do something different, but you can create the new ending now. So how are you going to choose your own adventure? What are you going to do to do that? Um, and I know Dan will send out a thank you email from me and some other tips. Here's the website, and there's a ton of different resources out there for you. Uh, so good luck to all of you in your careers and in your changes, and I hope to see you around the community in the future. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you again. And my thanks also go out to all of our guests for participating today. I specifically want to thank those of you who have donated to BU in the past. We couldn't put programs on like this without your support. 
Uh, we have six more great webinars coming up during the month of March as part of Alumni Career Weeks, where we have over 60 career events taking place online uh, and in cities around the world. So I'd encourage you to um, take a look at some of the other upcoming events that we have. Um, you can see that full list at bu.edu slash careerweeks. As always, if you or any BU alumni you know would be interested in uh, presenting a professional development webinar, or if you have a topic uh, that you'd like to showcase for the BU Alumni Association, feel free to contact me at the Alumni Relations Office or by email at dangard, D-A-N-G-A-R-D, at bu.edu. Thank you everyone for your time, uh, and I hope you have a great day. For those of you in the path of the storm, stay safe, stay warm, uh, and uh, I hope you all have uh, a wonderful rest of the day or evening, wherever you may be. Take care. Thank you.